Mr. President and delegates of the Party of European Socialists, let me say what a profound honor it is to be here together with you, and let me congratulate you on your leadership, on your re-election, and I think most importantly on your mandate for change which you have led because the pillars of that mandate are spectacular and most important for the world. It's my profound honor and delight to be here with you because you, the Party of European Socialists, are both the heirs and the leaders of the world's most important and most successful political path. In my view, the system of social democracy has proven to be the most successful economic and political system in the world in combining market efficiency, technological dynamism, social equality, and environmental sustainability. You've championed the combination of a market economy, heavy investments in research and development, a strong commitment to universalist ethical principles and fiscal redistribution, and a constant awareness of the environmental risks. And you've done three other things, in my opinion, which have been central to success. First, business has been a partner, but it's also been kept at arm's length from politics. Second, in the successful countries, campaign financing has remained a public commitment, not dominated by private money. And third, you have always chosen development and diplomacy over military approaches to global problems. Now, we are in the midst of a deep crisis now. I come from the United States. I see the problems when these principles are lost. In the United States, money has overtaken our politics. We do not have a commitment to redistribution. We have a commitment to low taxes, which are so low that they have enabled a massive underclass to develop and to continue to grow at great crisis to our society. Wall Street has been out of control because business has not been kept at arm's length. Business has taken over the levers of power. And this remains a threat to us today. And sad to say, military approaches in the United States have long been favored over developmental and diplomatic approaches. And this, I believe, unfortunately, has put the world too much in peril. Now, your leadership and role is crucial because while your principles are firm, the world is at great and multiple risk. War and violence is widespread. The environmental crisis is unprecedented. Inequality continues to rise within our societies and around the world. And there is constantly the threat of rising intolerance within our societies and around the world as well. So I ask you, the Party of European Socialists, for your leadership and boldness in the following areas. First, for the sake of the world, defend the core principles of social democracy. Do not gut the social welfare state under the pressures of this crisis. Do not allow the financial sector to escape regulation, especially when we've seen the dangers of allowing Wall Street to rule the regulators rather than the other way around. Continue to invest in research and development, and especially continue to invest in human capital. Now, as your president just said, the Party of European Socialists has always stood in solidarity with the world's poor. And there are two issues that I want to emphasize this morning. First, the world is meeting in Copenhagen. 
it is the poor who are already suffering massively by the climate change that is already underway. In my work with the UN Secretary General, working in villages around the world, we are already seeing hunger and devastation from drought of increasing intensity due to anthropogenic climate change. I spoke with African leaders in the last two days. They are being pressed hard to accept a miserable agreement of a tiny amount of money on the table. They're told, just go along with it, rather than hold for what you need to be able to adapt to climate change. Please do not push the poorest people in the world into a forced agreement which fails utterly to meet their needs. The $10 billion per year that has been offered for adaptation is a tiny fraction of what every significant serious study has shown is needed now. And this is what the African leaders are crying out right now. Please do not leave us alone. We are already in the forefront of the world's battle because you have put us there. And I'm sure that the party of European socialists will press for an equitable agreement in Copenhagen and beyond. We need, we need a carbon levy to finance the global public good of adaptation and mitigation of climate change. And the United States is the world's largest carbon emitter per capita of any major economy should be called on first to make good on this promise. What the U.S. has on offer reportedly in the press, $1.4 billion per year, is a tiny fraction of what the United States responsibly should be providing. That is about two and a half days of what the United States will spend in Iraq and Afghanistan war each uh, this coming year. We can do better for saving the global planet than that. <laughs> Second, as you state so eloquently in your mandate for change, please be committed and be in the forefront of the Millennium Development Goals. These are the world's only agreed goals to fight poverty, hunger, and disease. And literally, the very lives of 10 million children a year dying of poverty hang in the balance of our fulfillment of these goals. We are entering the 10th year of the 15-year process. We will have a global summit in September 2010, our last chance to adopt a plan of action to accelerate success in the Millennium Development Goals. Please come with your full voice, your full vision, your full commitment, and your full leadership to that summit in September 2010. What does full commitment mean? It means, first of all, living up to the so-called Glen Eagles commitments that were promised in 2005 that said by 2010, that means in three weeks from now, after all, ladies and gentlemen, that aid to Africa would be doubled compared to the 2005 base. It's been promised every six months. We are three weeks away, and it has not been fulfilled by Europe itself. This is not adequate for the kind of world we need and the kind of world we're trying to build. So 2010 is no longer a distant horizon for empty promises. It is the here and now, fulfilling the Glen Eagles commitments, fulfilling the 0 0.7 commitment, which Europe as a whole has committed to, five countries, five great social democracies, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, Luxembourg, in a great tradition, have always stood at the 0 0.7, but the rest of the countries need to do that as well. We need a financial transactions tax implemented, not only to keep the...
And by the way, Wall Street is gearing up to pay 20 or 30 billion dollars of bonuses next week and, and next month in Christmas season because we don't have this tax in place, because they're taking taxpayer money back into their pockets, because we still have government by Wall Street rather than government by the people. And we need this transaction tax to get this under control, but also so that we can meet the financial commitments we've made to the world's poor. The carbon levy and the financial transactions tax would provide us with secure revenues that are consistent with the promises that we've long made. Finally, with respect to the Millennium Development Goals, let me say the G8 promised a fund for smallholder agriculture to address the one billion hungry people. That was promised in July in L'Aquila, Italy. It has not yet been delivered. We need to make good on our word. Twenty billion dollars over three years was promised. Not one penny is yet in the bank and the hunger continues to mount. We need a global fund for health so that 500,000 women do not die in childbirth of readily preventable causes. We need a global fund for education so that 100 million children around the world are not left out of school but are enabled to meet their potential. And we need a new global fund for climate to address the needs of mitigation and adaptation of the world's poor people. Finally, leaders of the party of European socialists, we have to approach the world's crisis regions through a commitment to sustainable development, not through militaristic means. The latest surge in Afghanistan, I'm sorry to say, is doomed to fail. We will be spending $100 billion a year, ladies and gentlemen, next year in Afghanistan under the new plan, and only $2 billion for development of that impoverished country. A 50 to 1 ratio of military approach to sustainable development approach for a country suffering from drought hunger, lack of roads, lack of clinics, lack of safe water. This makes no sense. We will never solve problems like this through militaristic approaches. The same with the crisis in the Middle East, which your president just spoke of. Only sustainable development and a political solution for all sides can work. But we have a water crisis in Gaza. We have a, uh, a, an extreme poverty crisis that needs to be met through development. There is no other way. And I would also add, ladies and gentlemen, that in another fraught part of the world that Europe feels from, the Horn of Africa, Somalia with the piracy on the Red Sea, there is no way that a military approach can work. This is a drought-stricken, climate-stricken zone which needs a developmental approach if we're going to have any chance of a true solution. Two other quick thoughts and I close. First, it is our great task in all of this to fight intolerance in our societies. Our societies are also in tremendous demographic flux, changing population patterns, your ideals are universal ideals. They will be adopted in these changing societies. We need to fight intolerance to make sure that happens. And finally, I ask you, for the sake of my country as well, that the party of European socialists make common cause with the progressives of the United States so that we too can find a political course back from a politics which became dominated by money and dominated by military approaches. We too need to find your wisdom. We need to make common cause in that effort and indeed common cause around the world. Your cause is a European cause, but it's also a global cause. I so much admire you for that. I'm so grateful for the chance to be at your important meeting. Thank you for your leadership.